gone up to 100. Mm. Wow. <laughs> 204. Two hundred and eleven central. Oh. Okay. Right, just give it another little minute because it looks like we've got two hundred and twenty-three. So and then we'll just get started. Hi everyone. Right. Oh no, the numbers are still going up. It's a busy old afternoon. Right. Okay. Looks like the numbers have stopped at 238. So hello everyone uh, and thank you for joining us on this Intro to Remote Learning webinar. My name is Lee. I hope that I know quite a lot of you. I've seen quite a lot of the reg uh, registers and it looks like lots of Glasgow peeps. Um, so I lead up the digital learning team up in Glasgow. I'm a modern languages teacher by trade and now I support schools on how best to enable great learning experiences and innovate in technology, with technology rather. So remote learning, it is the topic at the moment in these unprecedented times, but the question really is what is remote learning and at this point I'm going to introduce you to the rest of the panel who I'm very lucky to call my friends as well as my amazing colleagues um, with this question whilst they also introduce themselves to you as well. So Jen what do you do <laughs> and what is your interpretation of remote learning? Hi everyone I'm Jennifer I'm part of the connected learning scene up in Glasgow and I'm also a primary teacher. To me Remote learning um, is being able to access learning no matter where you are in the world. And it makes you feel like you're in the room with each other, even though you're not physically there together. Absolutely, fantastic, thank you. Michael, you're on next. What is remote learning? Hi everyone, I'm Michael. I'm a transformation consultant for XMA. And these are all my colleagues and friends, as, as was said. Um, remote learning for me is really about um, connecting to each other, connecting to each other with your resources, with your face if you can, and with your voice. And it's a very different type of learning from the learning that happens in a classroom and the structure of a school day. And we need to pay some close attention to that. So that's me. Thank you very much, Michael. On to Steve Bunce. Who are you and what's remote learning? Thank you, Lee. Hi, uh, my name is Steve, Steve Bunce. I'm a, an Apple professional learning specialist and I work across the, the UK for XMA. Uh, background in, in teaching, began as a science teacher and moved into computing. And um, yes, remote learning. Remote often makes you think about being um, alone or isolated, but actually it's the complete opposite. It may be that you're apart physically, but it can that we can connect and we can collaborate as though we were working together um, in the same room. And back Thank to you, Lee. You. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Stuart. Hi, how you doing? I'm Stuart. I'm from the digital learning team at XMA and an Apple professional learning specialist as well. Um, remote learning for me is about creating ways to access education at a distance in another environment out with the classroom. Students are able to still access the curriculum, albeit it might be in a different location or at various times. It doesn't necessarily have to follow the 93 routine. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Gina, next slide, please, if you haven't already. I'm going to shove off my webcam now because you don't want to see my space for my remote learning. And uh, we will look at some of the stuff up here. So, um, I'm going to throw out a question actually to everyone who's joined. And hopefully by now you've kind of navigated the panel, the control panel down there, and you're able to maybe uh, ask some questions if you haven't already. So, what do you think is the biggest challenge in remote learning? What are you fearful of? What are your thoughts? Is it pastoral support? Is it keeping people engaged and interesting? Quality of materials, perhaps? The limitations of technology? Is it accessibility and access for everyone? Or is it the timings and the schedulings? Anything else? If you could comment, and please feel free to add any questions in the chat or comment section, and we will get to those once we've finished our discussions with one another. 
So for my own situation, I am now on day six in the big Milligan house. I am remote learning and working from home. I have two boys who I, who I have managed to get out of the house for this. <laughs> Um, Harry, who is 11 and he's in P6, and Thomas, who is 7 and he's in P3. Um, they're also needing my attention and needing taught, but meanwhile, I'm also trying to support schools and families with using this technology. And I suppose every day we're bombarded with thousands of links to information, to resources, to websites and apps, which all claim to, be, to, claim to enable remote learning, and it's fabulous, but how do we know that any of these resources, like the ones you're just seeing up now, all these apps, um, are they any good? How do we know when we should use these resources? Because you, you, you know, you don't want a situation where you're just sticking on an app and you know somebody's in front of a screen all day because that's not healthy for anybody. So my personal circum circumstance again as a family, we're doing pretty well so far. Um, and what I have learned from these past few days is that remote learning is still very much about te teachers designing rich and meaningful learning experiences, which are creative, but they're also collaborative. Um, and don't get me wrong, the collaboration, the communication is very different and the pace of learning is also much slower or maybe maybe it's not. It looks slower, but maybe actually my kids are learning a lot more. Um, there also seems to be a newfound sense of understanding and patience, though, for all. So for both teachers and learner, learners, and that, I'm absolutely loving that. Um, so my two boys are using two platforms or tools to communicate and collaborate with their peers and teachers. Harry is using Google Classroom and Thomas is using Seesaw. And I have delivered sessions on how to use these tools before, but it's been really great seeing it from another perspective as mum, as it were. So starting with Google, if Gina could just go to the next slide, please. Um, a lot of you have maybe come home and, or, or you have been told to use Google Classroom, or if there are any parents on this as well, you've been um, told that your child is using Google Classroom. So what is it? Um, Google Classroom is, I like to think of it as Google's kind of hub or service, which allows you as the teacher to create classes and to share files, to create and grade assignments, and if not assignments, then just tasks and to send feedback and communicate with your pupils in a paperless way and all in one place um, or app, namely Google Classroom. Um, it integrates seamlessly with the other Google tools like Docs, Slides and Google Drive. You don't need to keep saving it as it saves automatically. And all the teacher has to do is log in to Google Classroom. So if you're in Scotland, you would log into Glow and tap on your Google Classroom tile and you would uh, log into it. You would then tap on the plus icon and create a class and that's kind of on the left hand screen there of what you would see um, as a pupil then you can then join that class so harry had to then tap on the plus and join his class by adding in a code that was created by that teacher creating the class harry did it in under a minute no joke um, and since then he's been logging in every day and checking for assignments and activities um, he's been able to comment and chat to his friends about those tasks and he's been receiving feedback and advice from his teacher at regular intervals, not all the time, but regular intervals throughout the day. His teacher isn't online all the time, as I just said, but she has done a fantastic job of setting tasks which are problem based, they're flipped and they allow for creativity and collaboration. Most importantly, he seems motivated and isn't being dictated to by the school bell. Um, which to me as a second teacher as well, there's always that bell that you've got to get to and it's lovely to not have that. You obviously teach in chunks or learn things in chunks, but there's not that bell. Um, although in true to teacher style, I must say we do have a bell, which we ring for break time and lunch time and it is the front door bell, which both Harry and Thomas love dinging. So Thomas is in P3 and his school decided, the same school rather, decided to use Seesaw up to P3. He felt it was more intuitive to those age groups. Again, he was able to tell me how to log into his class with a QR code this time, not a code. And I love the fact that he was so excited to be showing me and that he felt involved and engaged in even this very simple task. Like Harry, he also gets daily tasks, which are sometimes optional, for example, Joe Wicks. But actually what I noticed was if I said, let's do Joe Wicks, he's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. When his teacher said to do Joe Wicks, he was all over it. And it's really lovely to have that engagement still with the class teacher. 
But anyway, I have talked enough and uh, I will be back, but I'm going to hand over to our resident Seesaw ambassador, Jen, to tell you a little bit more about Seesaw. So over to you, Jen. Thanks, Lee. So I'm going to take you through Seesaw, kind of how it normally works in the classroom, and then I'll talk about how it's working just now in line with what Lee was talking about with her son. So Seesaw is a platform that encourages parents and teachers to be involved in the learning process and the sharing of that learning. It allows pupils and teachers to track learning in the classroom and create an online portfolio. It also allows easy access for children to be at the centre of their learning and to have a voice in their own education. Normally, teachers and um, pupils would use the class app and then parents have the family app, which they would receive either a QR code or email link to join. Once they have set up and have access to their child's profile, they receive notifications when a teacher or pupil has posted work on them, on their profile. And once they see that, they can view the work, comment and like. When I was in class, my parents loved this. The fact that they could hear the children talking about their work and um, get involved with it and that, that opened up so many conversations with their child after school. That's how it normally works but obviously we're in a remote learning setting just now so it has kind of flipped slightly. So how it's working just now is as a communication tool as Lee was saying between class teacher and pupil. So teachers can post activities for students to do on their profile. And when the child logs in, they get to see those, they get to complete them. And then when they have done, the teacher can then mark them, give feedback, and then assign more activities related to the learning. At the moment, I assume just like Lee was talking about that parents, instead of going onto their family app now, are there with the child, at some point throughout the day and accessing through that child's profile. If you were in a class where it was a one-to-one -one device already and children were logging in independently and on their own profile, then not much will have changed. If you were in a class where it was shared devices and children were logging in through a shared QR code, then you've probably sent home a way for them to log in independently. This may be through a QR code, as Lee was saying, or an individual learning code. And now they can access their own profile and work away. It's been lovely to see so far already on Twitter, so many teachers commenting about how Seesaw is allowing for that engagement with students through this time, and that they are enjoying seeing how pupils are responding to the activities. Seesaw has an amazing help centre and you can see a link on the slide there for um, the frequently asked questions for remote learning with Seesaw. However, even if you just tap into the help centre via the app or desktop, whichever way you're accessing, the help centre is a vast resource full of so many helpful um, instructions and videos and they have a whole tab purely for remote learning. So all of the questions you can think of are there. However, even if you've get there and what you need to find out you can't find, you can contact Seesaw directly and they will get back to you. Seesaw is probably one of the most helpful platforms I've ever used as a teacher, so I highly recommend getting on the Help Centre. Even if you need help with the activity library and accessing the resources there or creating your own and posting it, whatever it is, they have the, they have the help there to allow this to happen. And as I say, it's been so lovely to see so many positive comments about how Seesaw is working in this remote learning environment. So that's just an overview of Seesaw. And now I'm going to pass back to Lee. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Brilliant. Um, and yes, Seesaw has been fantastic. But another really good tool um, that has been used a lot, especially in Glasgow at the moment, but I've seen it being used in loads of places, is Shobi. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Steve because Steve knows a lot more about Shobi than me and he's going to tell you all about Shobi. Steve. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, yes, I too am trying to adjust to, to life at home where we have uh, children uh, working from home and trying to rearrange their, their days really as to how they might work. And, and as Michael said at the very start of this, we, we can't really expect it to be like school but at home. It really is us all trying to find our way through this. 
And, um, and one of the tools which has been used uh, well by a number of different teachers and schools has been Shobi. So just as Jen was explaining there, in the classroom situation, when I first saw Shobi, it was because teachers were trying to maybe collect in some work the children had done, or maybe it was to actually to share out some resources with them. So in the early days of when the iPads were first coming into the classrooms, it was difficult to move documents around. And Shobi came along and it solved that initial problem of being able to hand out and collect in um, documents. But that could be not just documents, it could be a photograph you want to share with the class, um, and it could be anything that you want to share really. And then also, once you did collect it in, you could maybe mark it in the same way you might mark a document now. So you could do um, text boxes to respond to what the children have done, but also you could use handwriting tools with ink, or you could even use a voice comment. And that's been especially powerful. The, uh, the tool has developed over the years, and now we can use things like, as I say, putting assignments in there. And that's where we're seeing it more and more used for in this, this strange situation we find ourselves in now. So before in the classroom, it was very much more a way of handing out things and collecting in things, and it was used for homework tasks too. But now in this remote situation, it's really important, the real uh, way that the teachers can communicate with the children and can use that. Seesaw we've seen today, and the show we does a lot of the same things that Seesaw does. What I'd say is that um, Seesaw is often being used with the younger children, and tools like Google Classroom and Shobi tended to be used with the, the older children and students in the high school. A couple of examples I've just seen of uh, people using this remotely. One was an example from uh, a school where they were studying a text. So with their children, the teacher was able to share out a PDF document of the text. The children could read that. And then they had another sheet, another document, where they actually looked at it and analysed the text. They could circle different uh, synonyms or different descriptive words. They might also then write some answers to questions, comprehension type questions. And, and that was a nice simple way of just using the text and then using some feedback tool as a, as a text-based document. I mentioned before about the voice recording, and that especially has been used well in an example I saw where it was a computing example where the teacher had shared some code. So for example, it was a scratch bit of code and there were several blocks there. What the children had to do is look at that and try and work out what was going to happen before they even tried it or put it into the, the computer to see what happened. So there's some lovely examples there where the children were just describing each line of the code saying, I think this is going to do this. I think this is what we're going to see on the screen and predicting what they're going to see before then going on to using the the code itself. So Shobi, like the Seesaw tool, like Google Classroom, is, a, is another tool that's been used. What I think we, we found is where you are familiar with a tool or the children are familiar with a uh, with tool, to continue that familiarity works really well, rather than at this stage maybe trying to, to chop and change to another tool. Um, but I'd say Shobi has been really powerful in my experience of seeing it in the, in the schools. And just to yep. finish, if, if you search online, um, there is a, a webinar coming up soon with Abdul Chohan, and he's going to talk a little bit about using Shobi in the classroom. So again, you can search online for Shobi, and I'm sure they'll be advertising their webinar coming up too. Thank you, Lee. Back to you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think also um, that we've been asked as well maybe to do some, some Shobi stuff just for Glasgow as well. So looking forward to doing a little bit more about Shobi as well. So. Anyway, so we've talked about Seesaw, we've talked about Google Classroom, we've talked about Shobi, right? All brilliant tools. There is another great tool out there, which I know a lot of secondary schools are using. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of teachers are using it themselves. And a lot of corporations, businesses use this tool as well. It's Microsoft Teams. And I'm going to hand over to Michael, and I'd like him to tell us all about Teams, how it can be used, and yeah, what it, what it does, basically. Michael. Hello everybody again. It's um, going to have a look at Microsoft Teams then. Um, Teams is a solution that comes from Microsoft and what they want to provide is a one-stop shop for all of the communication, collaboration and classroom workflows that students and teachers are familiar with. It's a really powerful product and across all levels of education, business and industry and I think what Microsoft are trying to do is to make it as ubiquitous as Microsoft Word um, that tool we've all seemed to have learned you know, through osmosis. An actual fact, it was the regular use of that tool which made all the difference. 
So the best thing for us to do is to strip back and focus on some of the key functions that I think are going to be most useful to teachers. I'm going to mention five things and then you can decide if that's the kind of functionality that you want um, to do your connecting with your learners. So if we just move the slide forward, Gina, thank you. So the first is, I mean, it looks like quite a busy screen just now, I know I recognise that, but the first thing it does is it provides a conversation space for students and teachers to communicate in. It's very much in a social media kind of style. You make posts, people reply, you build a dialogue from there. And as a teacher, you may want to use that to ask questions, share a stimulus for learning, answer people queries, that sort of thing. And more importantly, the young people can support each other with their learning. So if they see a question that's difficult for them, they can help each other out with that. And we know, we know that you know, many of our learners are struggling with not being with their friends and fellow learners. So this kind of space gives them a forum to interact with each other. You can add files to the conversation, web links, emojis, GIFs. So it's a real social media friendly kind of approach which fits into um, what young people use. The second key part is a file space where you can share all of the digital resources with your students, all the stuff you would normally hand out in class, maybe in paper, anything digital, whether it's a PowerPoint, a presentation, notes, worksheets, workbooks, you just upload them to the files area and they're there for students to use. And if you want those documents to be read only, then you just drop them into the class materials folder, which has been made for you. Anything else, files you like students to collaborate on, write on at the same time, you can do that and you can view and edit those documents, presentations and spreadsheets from right within the team space. You never have to leave this screen to go and open up another piece of software. Thirdly, uh, every student's allocated their own personal notebook as a sort of digital binder for their notes and other resources that they collect or create for their learning. Um, I kind of think of it as a digital jotter more than anything else. They can write on that, they can draw on it, they can add videos. And crucially, like Steve said earlier, uh, we're finding that audio feedback is becoming really powerful. So you can leave audio feedback on a student's work, which is a much richer feedback tool rather than just using handwritten text or in my case, a bit of a scroll. But here you can go deeper because they tune into your uh, empathetic voice. You know, when your handwritten feedback tends to be short and not have much of a sense of your personality or your relationship with the child. So the depth and guidance you can provide through an audio note is quite powerful. Fourthly, you can create, assign and mark assignments completely digitally and store their marks in a gradebook. And it's really, it's completely paperless. So for example, I would issue them a piece of work, maybe in a Word document, attach a presentation to, they'd complete that work on screen and send it back to me, I mark it, it sends them your feedback and then the scores go straight into a gradebook which you can then export to Excel. And if you want to use self-marking quizzes that you get from Microsoft Forms, that's going to reduce the marking burden considerably. A couple of things on this next slide. Gina, thanks. Excellent. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the things that people love is that this um, application, you can download as an app or you can use it through a browser. So it's working across multiple platforms and that gives teachers the confidence that there isn't a gap in the reach to students. And of course, it means you can work across devices. I know I work across my phone, my tablet and my computer, and I just pick up from where I left off when I'm using Teams. On to the next slide, Gina, thank you. Finally, the ability to connect via video um, link to your learners and other staff remotely is absolutely crucial. And this time we've been, I've spent the last two days on webinars and chatting to my colleagues whilst I've been locked up. Um, setting up a meeting in Teams is incredibly easy. Pupils can see you and you can share your screen with them so that if you can still deliver presentations, and show resources just exactly as you would normally do in the classroom. So, that's really it for teams focusing on really five major things. We think about conversations, the access to files and resources, the ability to collaborate, an easier workflow, handing out assignments, and that video connectivity with your students. And that's teams. Yeah. Okay, brilliant, Michael. And obviously there's a lot more information out there on teams. Uh, this is just snippets of what all these kind of 
tools do. So video conferencing, though, this is what we're doing right now, and this is kind of where the world is going to more and more. It's been invaluable so far, but there are more than just uh, video. There are so many video conferencing tools out there. I mean, things like, what was it? I just had a house party the other night <laughs> on a video conferencing tool. Um, but for education, there is Zoom, there is Google Hangouts, there is obviously FaceTime. I've also heard mention on uh, loads of mention about Flipgrid, which might not be video conferencing. So what are all these tools? What do they do? Jen, you're going to tell us a little bit about that, please. I am. Thanks, Lee. So firstly, before I go into the options, some of the options that we have, I just want to say that when picking a video conferencing tool to use, I think it's important to pick one maybe that you either your school has established as what they want to use or one that works with the devices that you have. So picking it what best suits you um, because there are so many out there, so many great tools. Um, and I'm going to take you through a few of the features of five of them. But like I say, pick the one that works best for you and that you feel the most comfortable with. So the first thing I'm going to take you through is Zoom. So Zoom, like many, have both paid and um, free versions. So with the free versions, um, you can create a, an account. And once you've created an account, um, which anyone can do, you can then send out an invitation or a link to your call. This can be done via email, or you can pop it in a chat if you're on a WhatsApp chat or something like that with people. Key features of Zoom is that you can share your screen. So if you're taking people through a slide deck or tutorial, they can follow along easily. If you're the host, you can share your screen. So, um, sorry, I just said that, you can record sessions. Um, so if you're the host, you can record sessions, which means if people can't go on to um, the, the video live, the conference live, you can then send that video out to them so they're not missing out. And you also have chat options for um, question and answer sessions as well within Zoom. Next one I'm going to go through is Google Hangouts. So if you are a Google user, if you're using G Suite or Google Classroom, this could be the option for you. Um, Google Hangouts can be accessed through extensions on Chrome or via Gmail. And it can be done with audio, video calls or instant messaging as well. So a nice wide range that you can use. One thing I've so with Google Hangouts is there's a lovely support community with them. So if anything's not working properly or you're not sure how things should look, there's a support group you can go on and get answers and um, help with that as well, which is great. So a great one if you are a Google Classroom user or Google uh, G Suite user. Next, I'm going to go on to FaceTime, which is a video conferencing tool with Apple products. So using this with your iPhone, iPad or Mac. And again, you can use audio or video calls um, for people who are in your contacts. And you can do that either with their phone number or email. A few nice things that you can do with FaceTime is that you can have individual calls or group calls. Just depends on how many people you add into the FaceTime contacts. When you're on one call, if another call is coming through, you can put the first call on hold, answer the, the next call, and then go back to your first call if that's what you need to do. With the latest devices, so iPhone 10 onwards, you can use your Memoji as your face instead of your um, just having your webcam on. So this might be good for people who maybe feel slightly less comfortable with having their camera on, or maybe if um, parents don't want children to be using, um, would rather they use their Memoji rather than just having their camera. And you can also take photos within the calls as well. So if someone was showing something useful on the call, then you can have a photograph of that. Next, I'm going to move on to WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is great, I think, if you have people who are joining in from lots of different devices. So you might use WhatsApp already as a messaging tool. So if you head into your WhatsApp app and then go down to the bottom where you have your options and click the call tab, then you just start by calling one person. And once you have connected with that one person, you then add in all of the other participants that you wish to. Again, WhatsApp allows for audio or videoing, so you can have the choice there. Lastly, I'm going to talk about Flipgrid that Lee mentioned. This is slightly different to the others because whilst the others are all video conferencing, I would say this is maybe a bit more teacher friendly in the sense that a teacher signs up to Flipgrid, 
And once they do, they can they are given a grid, which they then post on maybe some discussion topics. Um, questions they would like their class to consider, debates, whatever it may be. Once they have got their discussion point on the grid, they can then send that out to um, their pupils and they can do that in two ways. It can be via an email or if you're a class that's using Google Classroom, you can pop the link straight into the classroom, which I think is great. Students can then view that discussion post and then respond with a video call. So that means that um, they're thinking about their answer before they post their video. Two nice features though is that one, teachers can decide how long the videos are allowed to last for and secondly they can view the videos before the rest of the class. So it gives the teachers a bit of security that all of the videos going on are appropriate. I think this tool would be a great tool for helping children learn that skill of listening, thinking about the response, responding and giving their opinion with it. Would be great for debates and creating real discussions without everybody being in the, the one conference together. So I think a really nice tool for, for class discussions rather than video conferencing as such. Like I said at the start though, there are so many options out there and these are just a few. If you put any of these into Google and have a look through, you'll be able to see other features that maybe I've not covered or different options. But like I said, please choose one that works well for the devices you have, that you feel comfortable with, and that your school or you have decided is best for you. Thank you so much. I'll pass you back to Lee. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, brilliant. And yes, yeah, so many options there, but I think these are some great options. Um, and I, I particularly love Flipgrid, actually. I've not really used it to its full advantage yet but we'll try it out so um there are also some secondaries who have been asking me the question and not even secondaries actually some schools who have been using show my homework for example for a long time also edmodo and um, so we're talking about all these new tools out there but what do we do uh, and what is rather show my homework and edmodo and how can they be used and i'm gonna hand over to michael to talk about these please hello again everybody um, so we'll start off with Show My Homework, which really, I suppose, does exactly what it says on the tin. Show My Homework's been growing in schools across the UK and it's online homework software and it allows teachers to set and distribute homework and resources to students. And it's trying to bring together the school, the teacher, the student and the parents so that everyone involved has an overview of what homework is out there, what's been set and what's due. And what that means is that everybody knows, and you know, can't tell any stories. I've not got any homework this week, Miss Mum, Dad. <laughs> That's not true, um, because they can see exactly what homework has been issued by the teachers in that school. So, to the extent about of it being used as a sort of remote learning portal, it really isn't similar to Teams or Classroom. Instead, it's really focused on sharing the homework for parents to see, for staff to easily distribute digitally. It does have a range of different types you can set. So it's got quizzes, spelling tests, it's easy to differentiate tasks and easily support that flipped learning model that exists in your classroom. So um, try not to think of it in the same, same kind of terms as Teams and Classroom and the others. It's doing something very specific to meet a very specific need that teachers and families have been asking for for quite some time. Uh, classroom and Teams are developing their solution, depending on what kind of license you've got to where you are in the country. Um, teams and Classroom can send regular emails to parents about um, homework that's due and assignments that are due, so um, some commonality there. Moving on to Edmodo, my experience up here with, in Scotland with Edmodo has tended to be in the FE and HE sectors. Um, Edmodo is a well established, and if you just move the slide on, Gina, thanks. It's a really well established and um, product. Um, it focuses on conversations and a learning management system for resources. And I guess in that regard, it shares a lot of similarities with Teams. Edmodo focused for a long time on the power of conversation and the power of connectivity with that resource bank that surrounds it as a learning management system. So it does have assignments, it does have sharing files, has conversations, um, 
very similar to teams in classroom. But what Edmodo also has is a large community of staff and interest groups who share resources regularly that you can dip into and access and take away, and lots of different ideas out there. And many teachers have found that incredibly useful because the Edmodo community has existed for quite some time now. Um, and so that's the two very different products. Show my homework in Edmodo. Edmodo is more closely aligned to classroom and to Teams. Well, as I said, show my homework was its own special sauce. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, as our professional learning specialists, we use the collaborative tools on the iPad a lot. Um, they're very simple to use. They allow for multiple users to work on a document in live time. And you don't need a certain app as such. Well, they're, they're inbuilt on the iPad. But you can collaborate without having that hub there as well. Um, so to talk a little bit more about this um, is Steve. Back to Steve. I feel like he's like in another place somewhere. There we go. There he is. Um, and Steve's going to tell us a little bit more about these collaborative tools. On you go. Thank you, Lee. Yes, um, in this, this webinar, we, we really are covering many different tools. And, and so please uh, don't feel overwhelmed by the number of different tools we're mentioning. What we're really trying to do is just mention a number of those which you either have encountered or not encountered yet and what we plan to do coming up is much more in depth on these different tools but just to explain as Lee mentioned there you've probably used if you're using an iPad pages and Keynote and probably numbers too uh, as ways of creating documents uh, adding spreadsheets or doing presentations but these also have a built-in collaboration feature to them so the way we again we've used this in a classroom for example with pages is it might be that uh, two children or a group of children have maybe worked on a document together where one of the children has created the document and others have added to it where it's been i've seen it more used more effectively is actually using keynote it's, it's sometimes easier to say to the children working in a group here is a presentation i would like you to work on these four slides and then someone else will be working on these other slides so you can use it like a collaborative tool there in our remote learning situation, a document can be shared with the, the children or with the class. And for example, they could start working on it and the teacher then could add to it or add voices um, in terms of recording voices or even recording videos as well. So built into a lot of these tools is the, the ability to collaborate. So if you, if you have the iPad, have a look at the pages, numbers or keynote. And when you look to see if you can share, you can see that you can share that with other people. And to do that, they'll need to have an Apple login, uh, but if they're already using their iPad or iPhone, then they'll have that already. So we'll go into more depth in the future, but really just to mention that tools you may have come across already do have this ability to collaborate with other people. And I'm going to hand back now because Stuart's going to tell us a bit more about using the Microsoft tools to collaborate. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And Stuart, yeah, basically Steve just introduced you, so I don't need to talk. So Stuart, tell us, please, about Microsoft Tools. Uh, Hello to all my colleagues that have signed up and are sending the messages during this as well. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, um, one yeah thing, similar to what... one thing to note, sorry, Stuart, is when you're video conferencing, make sure your notifications are off because I keep getting pinged and I'm paranoid I'm getting pings on this. But anyway, on you go. Sorry, Stuart, on you go. <laughs> similar to what um, Steve has discussed about collaboration with Apple products, the same is true with our Microsoft tools. Many teachers, educators, pupils, people that will be on this chat are used to using Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, maybe Excel throughout the school years. This might be behind a desk, maybe in front of it. And a lot of people have a familiarity with these products. Collaboration seems to be a key message that's coming out in today's chat. We want our pupils to be able to access work and work together on tasks and projects. And thankfully, as we've been discussing, there are a number of ways out there that allow us to do this remotely. If we wanted to share our work, the old school method, and I'll bet there'll be a lot of people out there that still do this, would be attach a document to an email, send it on, and then wait for some adjustments. And if you just click the next slide, Gina. Well, within Microsoft applications, all you have to do is find the share button. It's over at the right hand corner, and all you need to do is add an email, send it off, and that's it. Multiple users can be working on the same thing and changes are then made in real time. It's great if you've got a PowerPoint presentation task, for example, you can get students working on their own slides 
and at the end it's combined to give a finished product and article, giving everyone a stake in a finished product. This option is available within all Microsoft tools, so get sharing and collaborating on your Excel, Words, PowerPoints within Office 365 complete. Thank you very much. Um, and were you going to tell us a little bit about SharePoint as well? Yeah, and OneDrive and a little bit looking at what iCloud storage is because this kind of word gets bandied about, like in a uh -huh. cloud or saving things in a cloud. And a lot of the time you can ask, well, where where is it? Where is this cloud? And I'll be honest, it's something that I kind of struggle to get my head around a little bit um, as well. Um, on a wider scale, um, in the past, we we'll want to save things. We would save it to our computer and it would be stored there and it would only be stored there. If we wanted to move it, we'd have to use maybe a USB, a CD or cart a laptop from home to office, to school, etc. Well, an iCloud storage saves your work, which means that you can access it from multiple locations and from multiple devices. You can then share these locations and collaborate with others. There's a lot of options out there and we've discussed tons already today. Your technology giants, they've got their own versions of their iCloud storage. There's iCloud, sorry, there's Google Drive, there's Dropbox, and it comes back to the thing that we've been saying, either use what your establishment has recommended, or if you're starting out, use what you're familiar with. Microsoft's version of it is called the OneDrive. This works a little bit like an online My Documents folder, if you want to think of it like that. You can, stay, you can store and share your files and folders and access them at any time. Like I said, the good thing here as well is you can access it from any device. Log in and all your work is stored and is available. You can choose where to keep these files private for yourself and personal use or share certain ones and folders with others, allow them to view, download and collaborate. SharePoint, which you can see there as well, also utilises this cloud-based storage. It's viewed a little bit like a website and is used to share and collaborate files, but more on a wider basis. Using SharePoint, you can store documents that multiple users get access to, and they're kept up to date with these changes. Using a SharePoint, you can then send out maybe group messages so that everyone within your establishment or your classroom has access to that information, and it can be kept up to date with changes regularly. The difference between the two, and they are quite similar, but the difference is that OneDrive tends to be more for personal storage and individual use. You can share with others, it tends to be just a few. SharePoint is used more at a kind of an organisation level. It publishes information more for a kind of larger audience, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, I think we used to kind of use SharePoint more for our departmental stuff or within year groups we'd have different folders, but OneDrive was more for me as the teacher or the pupil would save their stuff onto OneDrive. Um, and that's how we used to use it. And yeah, I mean, we're talking about OneDrive and SharePoint there, but as Stuart said, there's obviously iCloud out there as well, and there's Google Drive too, Box, Dropbox, um, lots, and these are just different storage options that you can choose to use, and we'll, we can talk about that in more detail if you ever wish. So, some time for questions. I believe we've only got about 18 minutes left. Um, you're probably bamboozled with all the information. Oh, before questions, sorry, one more thing, Wakelet, and the reason we have kind of looked at this is because Wakelet seems to be everywhere right now and even I in the beginning was a bit like what the heck is Wakelet so Stuart very quickly you've got about a minute what is Wakelet what can it do for us yeah um you know to sum up if you think about it the internet is so vast and wide and we can easily get lost within there there's so much information that's being posted in so many different states that we can access to find things and it's just changing at a rate of knots, um, particularly with our current situation. And again, kind of many of us are wondering, well, where do I start? Where can I find credible sources of information? Wakelet is a great site that allows you to find, organise, save and store information surrounding topics that might be interesting to you. You can save videos, websites, even tweets and save them under a heading. You can then view them or share them with your students, which is good because then it means that you're giving them a credible source of information as well. If we find it tricky, how are they managing to kind of troll through a vast amount of knowledge? Um, there's a whole library that other educators have shared and they're called their own papers. You can see some there 
for home learning and remote learning. Um, kind of a good one that one of our colleagues, Nicola Patterson, used a good analogy um, of describing it. It's a bit like Pinterest, but more for education and curation purposes. And I really like that. So head over to wakelet.com, have a wee look yourself and give it a go. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Sorry for rushing you there. And you can also become a Wakelet ambassador. I think it should be a Wakelet wizard, but apparently it's a Wakelet ambassador. So we have a little bit of time for some questions. I'm just going to scroll through some of them. Um, lots of questions actually about Teams. Um, I've got a question here. Is Seesaw Gen? Would you say it's more for primary pupils? There's a question. I would say the look of it is definitely more um, primary based, I would say. Um, there's obviously nothing to stop any age range using it, but I think the look of it definitely appeals more to younger children. So I would say yes, more for primary. Yeah, I would say the same as well. I think um, Harry was looking at um, Seesaw and he was like, oh, that looks a bit babyish. But I think he was probably just winding Thomas up as well. But yeah, it's very, it's a lot more intuitive, a lot easier to use, um, a lot simpler, actually, in a good way, in a very good yeah. way. Um, um, so another one is, let me just look quickly. Questions, questions, questions. <clears throat> Do schools need to, sorry, another one for you, Jen. Do schools need to subscribe to Seesaw annually? Or anybody? Um, no, there are three versions of Seesaw, that, um, and the free version is extremely good. There are some features that obviously aren't included in the free version, so it's obviously working out what um, features your school needs or requires. Um, your school has probably already made that decision for just now, um, but no, you do not need to sign up annually um, to get going with it. You can. There's plenty you can do with the free version. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, one for Michael, our Teams guy. How many people can video chat within Teams at the same time? It was video chat, but I think video chat. So how many people can video <laughs> within at the same time? Yeah, there was a couple of Teams questions there. I saw um, one was about the, the number of people that can video conference at the same time. That's 250. So 250. Yeah. If you've got a class of 250 students, I hold my take my hat off to you that's, that's a big number um and that's that really allows you to do the, the the whole video conference with everybody's screens on and recording the session if you've got the record recording screen function in your tenancy uh, another question i saw there was about a class notebook and about recording audio within a within a team every child's got their own class notebook they can only see their own notebook no other child can see their notebook but as a teacher as per normal, you can see everybody's jot in our notebook, so you can see and hear what they're saying. So I think there was a little bit in the, the question about um, languages, you know, speaking in another language. Um, I know lots of modern languages teachers really liked it because young students could speak into the computer with their vocal test and, the, and then the teacher can pick that up and listen back to it whenever and wherever they like. Yeah. Any other Teams questions? Yeah, uh, do, 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 do. there was no, not for now, not for now. Oh, yeah, the audio files, you've covered that, okay. But Shobi, actually, Steve, Shobi, you can do the whole verbal feedback thing as well, can't you? How does that work? Thanks, Lee. Uh, the way I've seen it is, is generally where, um, almost like a student has finished a piece of work and handed that in, then the teacher can put some comments on it, and that's where you just say, let's add a, a voice comment to that bit of work. Uh, and then the, the student can look at that and see that's returned. Yeah. So that, that's the way I've seen it. It's, it's been more like sort of once you've completed a bit of work, you hand it in, the teacher can comment on it, you can send it back to the student. Um, and we've seen this used especially well in modern languages. Um, there's a number of modern languages teachers I spoke to, especially those actually who were from um, non, uh, from overseas. And they said it's it's just sometimes easier just to say it and to, to say, trying to explain what they're trying to mean by yeah. saying it obviously then trying to write something to explain what they're trying to say about pronunciation or their understanding of grammar yeah so yeah. it's been used especially well in modern languages yeah cool okay oh my audio has gone off on me there i hope you can hear can you hear me okay we can yes sorry sorry I, did i speak over you there the joys of wi-fi with children on the wi-fi too um, so, what are the tool, best tools, anybody, what are the best tools for additional support needs schools, so special educational needs establishments? Um, I, I presume they're talking about whether to use Seesaw or Shobi or Teams. Personally, I would say 
seesaw maybe, but whoa, anybody got anything to say about that? It really depends on the kids, doesn't it? I think what you want to try and do is you want to try and keep it simple. That that communication channel you want to keep as simple as possible. So anything that will allow you to do something that's more visual, um, even if using it in conjunction with apps like Discord, for example, and um, you can put that symbol, the symbols that you want to communicate with children with, um, something like Seesaw is nice and straightforward to get that communication over straight away in a pictorial and visual form. Yeah. And sometimes it's not actually the child that you're communicating with, it's the, the families at home. So it depends on what the family wants to use. So I think just like you'd have to have that one-to-one -one discussion with an establishment about what are your needs, what do you want? Uh, and we we talk a bit more in depth about what you actually want to get out of, out of that kind of tool that you want. So, but I'll give you details about how to contact us at the very end if you want more information about that. Um, just we are one, at- just one more thing. I'm Sorry, just one more thing about accessibility. Um, yeah. We know that across the, all of the Microsoft tools, there's a immersive reader, which will read yeah. out any piece of text on a, you know, on a per, not on a PowerPoint, but certainly on a Word document, um, kind of all the text read out to you and even translated into a different language. So there are tools out there that we, we will probably explore a, a later in the accessibility session um, from XME. Um, so look out for that. But um, that's, a, that's, that's been an amazing tool to help families and young people. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people actually from the audience are concerned about accessibility and access for everyone, suggesting that maybe those people who've got the technology at home, that's great for them, but maybe not everybody has the technology. Um, so yeah, it is a concern and obviously we're doing huge amounts of stuff in Glasgow so that we can close that gap as well. Um, and yeah, and I think, that's, uh, I think that's, that, that's going to be a big debate for people will be around you know the equity piece and you know what's been our response to making sure that every young person has access to learning regardless of where they are in life um, and that's something that a conversation that will continue to happen in this community and in others I bet. Yeah so yeah um, how many totally different question how many zoom on the free option at any one time I think it's 500 am I right does anybody else want to I think they opened up to 500 just recently. Hi Lee, um, I just looked there, um, it says 100, but I'm guessing because of the situation at the moment with remote learning, a lot of things are changing. So I know, yeah. for example, before um, this week, Zoom for the free version was only 45 minutes and I know they've extended that. So it could possibly be they've um, increased the amount of users as well. Um, yeah. So uh, Googling it just now, it says 100, but I'm guessing they've extended that. Okay. And yeah, actually, this morning I was on a Zoom chat and it said after 40 minutes, your time has been extended. And I was like, oh, brilliant, great. So they're doing brilliant stuff, working all the time. Things are changing, ever changing, as they keep saying. One more question and then we'll have to kind of close up with a wee conclusion. Um, unsure how to keep pupils engaged in PE uh, with the short time we have each period. Um, I don't know if that's from a remote kind of learning perspective, but I, I definitely think Loving Joe Wicks, it's my life saviour in the morning at nine o'clock. Gets everybody up, breakfast, we've got something to aim for so we're not all lying in bed. Not that my children like lying in bed that long. But anyway, we're not all lying in bed. We've got something to get up with, we've got that routine. And that kind of fills into, or goes into another question about how to, you know, how do parents kind of structure your day? I'd say still get into that routine of getting up, trying to start, at the day at nine o'clock, whether it's with you know Joe Wicks or anything that you like, um, do something a bit active, fill out your day in little blocks as well. And my kids, from a personal experience, they absolutely love having that bell, that doorbell to say, Oh, it's break time, oh, it's lunch time, oh, it's the end of the day, because they love that routine. Um, and uh, any other suggestions from anybody out there? Yeah, I think uh, the routine, the, the idea of routine is really good, but we shouldn't try and replicate a, you know, a six period day if it's in secondary, for example, because it, it just doesn't work successfully like that. Um, the one I like at the moment is Cosmic Kids, which is a kind of for younger children. I've got a little five year old, so we've been doing a little bit of yoga um, that's tied to things like Pokemon and Spider-Man and stuff like that. So he's really into doing that at the moment. Joe Wicks, he kind of gets really tired after 10 minutes and has to lie down. <laughs> <laughs> which isn't a bad thing either okay so thanks guys um in conclusion 
um, to our discussions, I think one thing is definitely clear. School is much more than learning and parents are definitely not teachers, okay? You know how to look after your kids, but you're not professional teachers and we don't expect you to be. We have to work together though to enable interaction, play, learning, what's right and what's accept unacceptable rather. It's about creativity, it's about pushing those boundaries, it's about trying new things and feeling confident enough as a learner to do so. It's about having a purpose to learn and it's about finding your own style and pace of learning. So whereas I like to get up and do Joe Wicks and I've got a doorbell, not everybody works like that, okay? It's just a suggestion. As a team of educators who are passionate about what technology can bring to learning and teaching, we have been highlighting the need for education to be more than just confined to the classroom for a while now. And perhaps the position we find ourselves in at the moment will allow us to see the positives that it can bring. You're all doing an amazing job, guys, and I just want to finally highlight the free ongoing professional development portals which are available to you as educators to access. So this would be my, my first kind of stop and stop scrolling through Facebook and all that because it's got loads of information there. But these tools here on Apple Teacher, Google for Education Teacher Centre and the MEC have got some fabulous CLPL opportunities for you as educators. If you want to know anything more about anything that we have discussed today, please use the following contact details. Next slide, Gina. And we would love your feedback too. Uh, we're also looking to make this a regular thing. So this is the first in a programme of webinars next week. Um, we're planning to be back together to discuss collaboration. More details will follow, but we're thinking maybe Wednesday. Um, same kind of time because it's quite good after school. So stay tuned via Twitter, LinkedIn and or email. And thanks for everyone for joining. Thanks to my lovely panel and the team. And finally, remember to please stay, stay safe and look after each other and breathe. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Bye. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, bye. Guys, bye, -bye.